Again, my name is Dr. Patrick McEnany. I'm one of the surgeons down here at Milford Regional Medical Center. Uh, I grew up in Massachusetts, just north of Worcester, uh, in a small town called West Boylston. And as a matter of fact, I did my medical school training at UMass and went on to do my surgical training there. And actually, Dr. Batra and I were uh, in residency together. We actually even played football together and we had medicine versus surgery football <laughs> games and I still feel bad about, uh, I think I broke your elbow accidentally <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, which was, I felt, yeah, <laughs> and I still feel awful about that. Um, but ultimately, uh, upon completion of my minimally invasive fellowship, I came down to Milford Region Medical Center where I've uh, been here in practice for the past seven plus years and now I'm uh, chairman of the Department of Surgery here. And what I want to do is spend some time talking to you a little bit about when surgery really comes into play. And uh, as well stated by Dr. Batra, you, know, you can see that a lot of the medicines that we have today actually do a tremendously good job at uh, controlling the heartburn symptoms but certainly there's some people who will break through and ultimately come to see me for those issues. Next slide. So uh, presently, who are the patients that ultimately are gonna require surgery? Well, certainly there's individuals who are sick of taking medications. More often than not, these are the, the younger patients that I have that aren't really keen on taking medications for the rest of their life. Uh, they may have an intolerance to some of the proton pump inhibitors, you know, and again, as Dr. Bodger pointed out, uh, about 80% of people with just normal dose therapy will have complete relief of their symptoms and as such don't need to undergo the risk of an operation uh, for this. And nearly 100% of people will actually have improvement with increasing doses of their proton pump inhibitor. Now, unfortunately, Sometimes people will still have secondary symptoms. And those secondary symptoms include things like the aspiration pneumonia, asthma, or uh, hoarseness of their voice. Those are the things that we now call secondary symptoms that are things that can indicate that even though the acid may be neutralized, you can still have reflux of contents. We, in putting you on those medications, it doesn't prevent the reflux, it just actually turns down the acid component so it doesn't burn as much. But you're still refluxing, it's just neutralized fluid. But there are other components within that uh, material that can still cause some changes. So even though people may be taking an over-the-counter dose of even an H2 blocker, if they do that for long enough, they can still develop problems over the course of their lifetime. Uh, certainly individuals who start to develop uh, complications related to their uh, reflux, such as those who develop ulceration and then subsequently secondary stricture, those are people who we sometimes want to get, uh, we want to uh, prevent that reflux from continuing to happen to their esophagus. As I mentioned, the respiratory complications, asthma, uh, and the vocal cord injury. And then lastly, with the Barrett's esophagus, uh, there's some data to indicate that, uh, that the increase uh, in adenocarcinoma is in large part due to the fact that there's a whole host of people who are just simply taking an over-the-counter over dose of an antacid, whether that be Tums, whether it be uh, an H2 blocker, or a proton pump inhibitor, and some of those people who may not see their primary care physicians very often will then subsequently never make it to the gastroenterologist to find out that, you know what, I've really got esophageal cancer, and I can say that my own uncle fell victim to that same uh, phenomenon. Next slide, please. So with surgery, ultimately what we are trying to do is to recreate that LES, or the lower esophageal sphincter, and what's called the HPZ, or the high pressure zone. Ultimately, when we, uh, when we are basically at rest, the lower esophageal sphincter, which again, as Dr. Botcher pointed out, is not a 
sphincter like we have on our backsides. It's just an area of the esophagus that is a bit tighter to prevent that reflux from happening. But when we swallow food, when we eat, one of the first things that it does is to open up and relax so that the food can get propelled down the esophagus and get into the stomach and then gradually it will reclose to prevent acid from going back up. Now, next slide. In individuals who have a hiatal hernia in which the lower esophageal sphincter is now up in the chest, what happens is this right here is the diaphragm and up above that you can think of this as essentially a vacuum. It actually pulls apart, so to speak, the lower esophagus. So it makes it harder for it to actually be in a closed state. And as a result, it's easier for the contents that reside within the stomach, of which a portion is now above the diaphragm or herniating into the chest, to go up into the esophagus. So part of what our surgical treatment is to do is to basically bring this back down to below the, to be below the diaphragm. Now, next slide. There are a whole host of different types of hernias and this is where some of those studies that we look at preoperatively really come into play. The barium swallow and the upper endoscopy are really most critical to help define some of the different types of hernias of which there are four different types. Type 1 is by far the most common. Most people in this room who have one probably don't even know that they have one and their only manifestation is going to be heartburn. Now individuals who have the other types of which there's type 2, type 3, and type 4, go figure, uh, can sometimes actually have pain in their chest that's perhaps a bit dissimilar to the symptoms of heartburn, uh, but can uh, still have heartburn-like symptoms, but sometimes they will uh, develop vomiting or pain that's just really not going away. But as Dr. Botcher pointed out, first and foremost, gotta think of your heart first, make sure we get that ruled out, because once again, the, these types of hernias are less common. Now, this type of hernia, it, again, is fairly uncommon in which the lower esophageal sphincter is basically in its normal anatomic position, yet a portion of the stomach is pushing alongside the esophagus, what we call a rolling type hernia. Now, with the increased number of CAT scans that we do, we have been able to pick up a lot more of these types of hernias that perhaps weren't picked up years and years ago. Next slide. And now we are starting to see people who have type 3 hernias and, and this is basically a barium swallow that shows uh, what a type 3 hernia is and basically not only is the the diaphragm for all intents and purposes is basically right, right here and the lower, not only is a portion of the stomach up in the chest, but the lower esophageal sphincter is also in the chest. And this is uh, one of the most common types of parasophageal hernias that we see. Next slide. And lastly is really type four. And this is basically when you get everything up in your chest, including the kitchen sink. Uh, fortunately, not terribly common, but we do see it uh, uh, fairly often. Uh, this is when in addition to having stomach and your lower esophageal sphincter up in the chest, now you've got other pieces of either intestine like small intestine or large intestine. Sometimes the spleen or even the pancreas can start to go up into the chest. And these are far more complicated operations to do and we've done a few of them uh, here. This doesn't necessarily need uh, to be done at a tertiary care facility. Uh, but certainly these are a lot bigger operations. This isn't uh, a day surgery operation by any stretch. Next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through uh, some of these. This is just a, a picture of the enteric uh, procedure that was done in which that biopolymer was basically injected at the lower esophageal sphincter to try to give it some bulk to try to prevent that reflux. Unfortunately, 
Uh, you know, there were a number of uh, reports in which some of this polymer got injected outside the esophagus and because of uh, some deaths that were ultimately reported with this, this has since been taken off the market. Another procedure that, uh, that Dr. Batra alluded to, next slide, is, was the Strata procedure <coughs> in which uh, there's basically a radio frequency uh, delivery to the area of the lower esophageal sphincter that essentially causes some scarring in this region and essentially tries to create a bit of a stricture, so to speak, to prevent that reflux. Um, used in some places, we don't really use it here, and it's not really the first-line treatment. Again, first-line treatment is by far medical um, and not something that we regularly utilize here. Next slide. Uh, in addition, uh, there's what we call an endocinch uh, procedure in which a portion of the uh, the junction of the lower esophagus and a portion of the stomach are basically pinched together to try to recreate that lower esophageal sphincter. Unfortunately, with each of these, with the exception of perhaps the uh, enteryx, which is off the market, if you've, if you've got any one of those hernias, which is primarily m the main component of reflux, that it's not going to fix some of the major problems, especially for those parasophageal hernias, the type 2, the type 3, and the type 4. Next slide. It's an Eastern Bloc data there. Yeah, exactly. So uh, before anybody is going to get an operation, ultimately they're going to need to have a number of studies done first, uh, even with the most beautiful story of reflux, because ultimately we want to make sure that we've got uh, the appropriate studies to know exactly what we're up against. The last thing that we want to do as surgeons is to have surprises in the operating room. You know, if I find out that instead of having a type 1 hiatal hernia, I've got a type 4 at the time of surgery, that would be disastrous. We want to know as much information about what's going on uh, before we uh, operate. And so in addition uh, to the upper endoscopy, uh, that oftentimes includes biopsies in areas where there's some s suspicion for Barrett's esophagus. Patients will get that manometry study, which again is that tube that uh, will go down the esophagus through the nose and there's swallowing that takes place that allows us to see how well the esophagus contracts. And that gives us a great deal of information to decide uh, how we're going to essentially wrap the stomach around the lower esophagus, and I'll go through that in a little bit uh, to try to help enlighten you as far as how that information helps. In addition, we get the 24-hour pH study, and that helps gives us what we call a Demeester score that gives us an indication as far as uh, how frequently and how much time is actually spent with a low acid. Now, what that means is you actually have to be off of your medication, not all of your medication, but the medications for heartburn for a period of time. And for a lot of people, that unfortunately can be very miserable. I'm sure that there's plenty of you out there that, that if you miss a day of your heartburn medication, it's just disastrous. And, but unfortunately, this is one of the tests that we uh, do to, to try to get a data point so that if there's issues that arise postoperatively, we have a starting point to compare to. Uh, in addition, the barium swallow will help give us some of the anatomic uh, pictures that we're looking for. And occasionally, uh, depending upon the history, we will put people through what's called a gastric emptying study. Because if the stomach does not empty well, ultimately that co those contents need to go somewhere and they're going to end up refluxing back up into the esophagus. And if we simply wrap the uh, the stomach around the lower esophagus to tighten things up and the stomach isn't emptying, we've essentially created two points where things are going to just fill up in the middle, uh, kind of like a big sausage, so to speak, and you keep on stuffing meat in the sausage and eventually it wants to pop. Now, in general, the stomach isn't going to pop in that situation, but I have to be honest with you, there's a, there's a side effect that can happen to people after surgery that we call gas bloat syndrome in which the stomach basically fills up with a lot of fluid and gas and basi basically people feel very, very bloated. That's not a fun thing to go through, especially it's, if it's 
persistent beyond a short period of time after surgery. And so depending upon uh, what other medical problems some people may have, for example, if people who are diabetic are at higher risk to have what we call uh, gastric dysmotility. So the stomach just simply doesn't squeeze well enough to get those contents out. And so it, it may uh, alter our decision uh, on surgery. Next slide, please. So ultimately what we're trying to do, and this is basically a shot from inside the abdominal cavity, uh, is to basically close up the hole in the diaphragm. So this right here, this muscle that you can see on either side, this is the diaphragm. Again, that's the muscle that separates the chest cavity from the abdominal cavity. And normally, the stomach belongs down here in the abdominal cavity, not up into the chest, basically on the other side of this uh, screen, so to speak. And so what we need to do is to do the dissection necessary to get that down into the abdominal cavity, and then we need to put some special sutures here to close up that opening because what's happened is the normal opening in the diaphragm has gotten bigger, and in doing so, it's allowed the stomach to slide up into the chest. Now for a type one hiatal hernia, again, that was that very sort of simple and straightforward, the most common type of hiatal hernia. The surgery for that is a lot more straightforward because there's just a little bit of the stomach that's up there that oftentimes comes down fairly easily. Now the other types of hernias, the type 2, the type 3, and the type 4, those are certainly a lot more work. Next slide. Now in order to recreate the high pressure zone or recreate that lower esophageal sphincter, it's not just a matter of getting the sphincter back down into the abdominal cavity. What we want to do is to, uh, to tighten things up a little bit. And so how do we do that? Well, we basically take a portion of the stomach here and we wrap it around the lower esophagus. Next slide, please. And we essentially suture the, or stitch, the stomach to a portion of the esophagus as well as to the other side, what we call a fundoplication. And some of you may have heard the term Nissan, or some people will say Nissan, but it's Nissan, it's not a car, it's, it's the type of wrap. Basically the surgeon who developed this you know, threw his name on it, and there's a whole different types of, there's different types of wraps that we do. Now, the decision as far as whether or not we do a full wrap or what we'll call a Nissen fundoplication versus a partial wrap, next slide, in which we wrap the uh, stomach just partially around really depends upon some of those preoperative studies. When we wrap the lower esophagus, when we wrap the stomach around the lower esophagus, it's purpose purposefully trying to create some tightness there. So in doing so, what it means is that uh, food's going to have a little bit of a harder time to go down into, or down through the esophagus and into the stomach. And there's no doubt that there's going to be some swelling that occurs resultant from the dissection necessary to do this surgery. And so as a result, next slide, uh, we oftentimes will put people on a special diet. So when we, when we do this surgery, depending upon the extent of the hernia, typically people will stay one to two nights in the hospital, depending upon their age, what other medical issues they may have that may need to keep them longer, and certainly the degree of dissection. If it's a very straightforward, again, type one hiatal hernia, uh, oftentimes there's a lot of folks who actually do that just as a day surgery, and we have to sometimes fight the insurance companies because they say, look, you know what, this is only going to be what we call a 23-hour observation, and we got to, you know, start swinging back at the insurance companies at times because you know what? People aren't just, uh, this isn't, you know, just uh, day surgery oftentimes. It's a, it's a big deal. Um, as a result of the fact that we have to do this wrap, the way that I typically uh, progress people through is I, I have them basically on a pureed diet 
for a couple of weeks and then gradually increase the texture of foods that people are allowed to eat. Now ultimately what that means is that uh, there's going to be certain things that are going to be off the menu. In other words, you know, if you decide two weeks after surgery that you're going to go down, you know, to, uh, to go have a big steak, chances are you're going to be in the emergency room asking for Dr. Batra to basically pull out that steak plug because it's not going to be able to get through that, that tightness of the wrap. Uh, in addition, there's going to be some surprising things. You think something as soft as bread you know, bread's soft, it should pass down easily. If you ever feed ducks at a pond, throw that bread in, what's the first thing that it does? Yeah, it swells up like there's no tomorrow. And the same thing happens as that piece of bread goes down your esophagus, and so it can get lodged and stuck there as well. Now, does this mean that, you know, that those kind of foods are going to be perpetually off the menu? No. But to a certain degree, what I do is I have people graduate through a program of increasingly textured foods and to a certain degree it's some trial and error. In other words, uh, to try a, an increasingly textured food and if it has a tough time going down, okay, give it a week to try it again. Because doing the wrap is kind of like tying your sneakers. So I'm sure all of you have, you know, tied your shoes in the morning and at the end of the day, the laces are a little bit looser. And that's exactly what we want to have happen to a certain degree with this operation. If, this, if the wrap were to remain as tight from day zero to the end, people would actually be pretty miserable because in the early phases, people have a very difficult time eating. As a matter of fact, almost every patient will have what we call dysphagia or difficulty swallowing. And that's in part due to the dissection, it's in part due to the swelling, and also we're wrapping the stomach around the lower esophagus, so it's going to be harder for foods to pass through that wrap. But with time, as the swelling subsides and as the wrap loosens a little bit, those are the things that are going to allow food to pass down more easily. And ultimately, uh, you know, I as far as recovery is concerned, uh, I typically uh, tell people that they'll, you know, feel back to normal in about six weeks. Now, does that mean you're... Attention, please. It is now 8 o'clock. Yep. <laughs> okay. In case you guys are visiting. Right. Thank you. Now, ultimately, uh, does that mean you're going to be out of work for that entire period of time? No, it just <coughs> means that you know, it's going to take time to feel like your normal self again. Sometimes it's longer than that, sometimes it's shorter than that, but because we're able to do the surgery laparoscopically, you know, 99 times out of 100, if not even with better statistics, then uh, the recovery time is much more rapid. So that's when we do the surgery through small incisions and, and oftentimes people will complain a pain that's just underneath the rib cage here and that's because you know, your stomach is actually not right here. It's actually up underneath the rib cage here. And, and to, because of that, one of the uh, trocars or the tubes that we put in to do the surgery really has to hug the rib cage there. And, and that's the part that smarts a little bit. And so I always try to tell everybody it's going to hurt here for a few weeks and sometimes even up, up to that six week mark. Next page. So. What, what do I tell people as far as their overall expectations? Well, in general, at five years, about uh, studies would indicate that about 70 to 95% of people will still be essentially uh, symptom-free. Now, fortunately, <laughs> the, the risks of the surgery, especially with the more straightforward types of uh, hernias, have a very low morbidity and mortality the more complex the hernia, such as the large type 3s or the type 4s, those certainly have a much higher risk. And typically those occur as people get older. Again, that hole start, you know, as we age, that hole gets a little bit bigger. We put on a little bit more weight. It puts more pressure on our abdomen. It decides to stuff more of your intestinal contents up into your chest where it doesn't belong. And ultimately, that can actually cause uh, what we call pulmonary or lung compromise because if you put too much stuff up into the chest, 
you got other organs up there that need that space, specifically your lungs. And I've had a few people who, who literally we've had to operate on because of worsening shortness of breath, and it's not because of aspiration, but because of simply the, the lungs don't have enough room to expand into, and we've got to get everything back down to where it needs to get to. Now, if you look at five years, although people will be symptom-free, uh, about a third of them will actually be back on some type of medication. Now, will it be at a full dose of where they were at or uh, the, um, the same dose that they were on preoperatively? More often than not, they are not. But at 10 years, about 50% of people will be back on some degree of a proton pump inhibitor. And again, this, all ha this isn't a sign of failure, but rather a sign that it's normal for the wrap to loosen a little bit uh, to allow people to uh, um, have more normal food intake, and it's just the nature of the beast. Things are going to loosen up over time. Now, unfortunately, pe uh, patients who have atypical symptoms, like the, that feeling of a lump in their throat, uh, those people are probably going to not have as good of an outcome. They may still have that lump in the throat feeling. So if that's the only symptom that they're having, there's a lot of things that we have to look at. Now, uh, in my experience, some of the other atypical symptoms, such as the uh, vocal cord uh, issues or the recurrent aspiration, those are people who, you know, we study fairly extensively to really prove that, yes, that is the cause of their reflux before putting them through their surgery and we've had uh, very good outcomes with that. Now, some of the other side effects from the surgery, as we talked about, gas bloat syndrome is, uh, is a fairly common symptom in the early phases. And there's a couple of nerves that travel down the esophagus whose job it is to help uh, do what the stomach does, which is to basically squeeze up the food and spit it into the small intestine. And when we do this dissection, we have to be very careful not to divide those nerves but there's no doubt that in the process of doing the dissection that they're not big fans of uh, getting moved around and uh, being taken out of their nice, warm, safe place up in the chest. But we've got to bring them, we got to bring that lower esophageal sphincter back down into the abdominal cavity. And as a result, sometimes the nerves take a little bit of a break. And instead of making the stomach contract really well, the stomach basically, again, will fill up with gas and people will feel a bit bloated in that early phase. But with time, as the nerves recover, the majority of patients will have resolution of this. Uh, diarrhea can sometimes be a symptom uh, that follows, but oftentimes that is uh, transient. And almost universally, uh, patients will have dysphagia early on. And the way that we try to combat the dysphagia part is realistically by putting uh, folks through a graduated program. In other words, we start them on a pureed diet, things that are going to pass through the wrap really easily, and then slowly increase the texture of the foods so that the whole process is a bit uh, uh, more comfortable for folks as they're going through their surgery. And here it says, it says only says uh, 8 to 12 percent of parents will uh, have dysphagia. That's if we basically start them on a regular diet. Uh, immediately after surgery. I think most people would say that almost universally patients are going to have some degree of, of dysphagia. Next slide. I think that's, uh, so that's the big part of the surgical arm of things. The one thing that I do want to just uh, let you know about, so the type 1 hernias, which again are the more common type of hernia, uh, those folks more often than not, you know, with primary care physician's help and Dr. Batra's help and his group, those folks oftentimes don't re ever require an operation, but at times when there are breakthrough symptoms or there's uh, secondary symptoms will require my help. Those other types of hernias, the type 2, the type 3, and the type 4, which may or may not uh, be associated with reflux, but oftentimes are uh, those almost universally will require an operation. Uh, there are some instances in which uh, individuals may be too frail uh, to undergo an operation, and there are uh, times where they experience problems 
uh, may uh, be very infrequent, and so we may elect to not operate on those individuals because unfortunately, especially with the uh, with those types of parasophageal hernia, what can happen is the stomach can actually lose its blood supply because sometimes it will twist up in the chest uh, and that can be a major problem and turn into a surgical emergency and that, that's what we really want to try to avoid. Uh, my name is A.J. Batra. I'm uh, with Milford Gastroenterology. Um, very pleased to be with that group and lucky. Uh, I think um, we have a lot of good providers there and that we're very grateful to be affiliated with this hospital, and um, we really appreciate your support. Thank you all for coming out, and I hope we can uh, give you a lot of information and answer some of your questions about gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is all too common. Um, I might be a little bit sick because I do love it, and I'm glad to talk about it. So, um, if you could go to the next slide, please. We can't unfortunately get this to uh, to work, uh, but I wanted to talk to you about what it means to have gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, some of the mechanisms that uh, might be in place to make it occur. Um, what uh, else could be a part of the diagnosis? Because there's some overlap, things that it can mimic or uh, can be mimicked uh, to be uh, fooling us to thinking it's reflux. And also, what can it do to you as a patient and uh, what can you do about it to treat it? I'm sure that's something that everybody has uh, thought about that's probably here. Next slide, please. And the spirit of the season, uh, I thought I would um, throw this up here. Uh, you know. I guess the point is that sometimes it's very obvious reasons why we're having heartburn, and we should look <laughs> for those first. Um, I wanted to also introduce myself a little bit more, and uh, I wanted to also say uh, that I'm very grateful to be speaking here with Dr. McEnany, and being the uh, hopeless romantic that he is, he's here with all of us tonight on his wedding anniversary. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> let's wish him a happy anniversary here. How many years, Patrick? Thirteen. Thirteen, 13 years. Wow, that's, that's pretty good. Lucky thirteen. Um, I myself am from Pennsylvania, uh, came up here over 16 years ago to uh, do training. Everybody comes to Massachusetts to get trained in, in uh, medicine because it's the best place to get trained. And I remember telling my parents that I'm going to be going up to, to uh, Massachusetts and um, my mom and dad were pleased and my father's like, well, you're probably going to end up living there. And I was like, really? I don't know about that. Maybe I'll come back down to Pennsylvania. And he's like, well, you're going to meet great people, you're going to get a great job. And, you're going to meet a girl and you're going to settle down. And <laughs> as fathers often are, he was right. So this is home now. I'm, I'm still an Eagles fan, uh, so I know all about Ajita. But um, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is where I, I can't keep my, my little ones from becoming Red Sox and Patriots fans, no matter how hard I try. But that's the way it goes. Next slide, please. Um, so <coughs> it might seem like common sense, but gastroesophageal reflux disease is the reflux of gastric contents, stomach contents, into the esophagus or all the way up into the mouth. Um, as we'll talk about, it can have manifestations uh, beyond the esophagus itself. Um, it's normal in most people to have reflux of some sort. It doesn't necessarily cause symptoms or problems. Um, most people have brief episodes uh, that they're not even aware of every day. It's, it's part of the normal physiology of uh, being a, a, a living human being. Um, and they don't get uh, complications from it. But then, uh, next slide please, there are uh, people that who, uh, have GERD, as we call it, gastroesophageal reflux disease, that will experience um, symptoms that are uh, like heartburn, regurgitation, vomiting, difficulty with uh, pain, uh, swallowing problems, pain on swallowing also included in that. And it can also, as I mentioned, go outside the esophagus, affect the vocal cords, cause uh, a sore throat, uh, even cause pneumonia, as there can be something called aspiration that can occur. Thanks. Um, there are times when uh, people get tested for how much acid they're having and it's not necessarily uh, the amount that's occurring, it's more as we'll talk about the frequency of the acid. So there's no set amount, like how much acid is abnormal. There's no, no uh, threshold that you cross. So by definition, gastroesophageal reflux disease is when you experience symptoms, uh, sometimes classic like I've just listed, that occur more than two to three times a week. About 10 million people in this country, and in some estimates, 20 million people in this country have heartburn or similar reflux symptoms on a daily basis. Um, for those of you who haven't had it, and if you have, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Heartburn is a burning sensation in the center of the chest. It can spread upward. It can spread to other parts, go to the neck and throat, and it's not a very fun thing to have. It can also cause an acid taste in the mouth. And uh, this is sometimes how it feels, um, which is rather unpleasant, as you can imagine. <laughs> As far as uh, people who experience this in our country, weekly and monthly, 20% on a weekly basis, uh, up to 60% on a monthly basis. So this is a very common problem and 
I think I, uh, that's part of the reason why there's such a good turnout for this uh, discussion. Um, other things that can occur, and there's several slides, and there are quite a few slides I have to get through, and I, I'm sure people are going to have questions. I think in the interest of getting through the material and um, for the sake of efficiency and because Dr. McEnany is going to be following me, maybe we can reserve questions to the end. Uh, so if you do have the notepads, write those questions down. People can get uh, upper abdominal pain, also known as dyspepsia. Um, they can have chest pain that doesn't feel like the burning sensation and can wonder, is it my heart or is it my esophagus? Um, there can be difficulty swallowing, as I mentioned, that's known as dysphagia, pain on swallowing, which is known as odynophagia. And uh, next slide, please. A number of other manifestations, um, laryngitis, sore throats, uh, chronic cough, asthma, especially if it only occurs at night. Uh, there can be problems with actually regurgitating materials up into the mouth that's not really vomiting. Uh, there's a whole other entity called rumination syndrome that people actually uh, can bring up contents to the mouth voluntarily. Um, there is a sense of a lump in the throat, also known as globus sensation, that can occur. It's kind of controversial whether it's reflux or not, but that's on the list of possible causes. Um, your dentist might even say, you know what, I think you have reflux disease. You're having a lot of problems with your teeth, and that can be also an issue. Um, I mentioned pneumonias. There can be chronic sinusitis, um, and people can feel like they're choking sometimes and have acid as the cause of that. I do keep mentioning acid. Um, there are many components that can reflux from the stomach, not just acid. Uh, there can be uh, bile and other digestive enzymes, but acid is the main culprit in what's causing the damage. Things that you should really come to see me about immediately if you're having these problems uh, for a prompt evaluation, that could mean that there's more serious complication include that problem with swallowing. That could mean that there's a narrowing or something that's growing in the esophagus that's not letting things pass through. Um, if you're having unexplained weight loss, uh, chest pain that's been ruled out by a cardiologist to not be from your heart, um, that could mean that there is some damage going on that you're not aware of. If there's signs that you're having bleeding, um, you might regurgitate blood or vomit blood or see black or tarry bowel movements, that could also mean that there's something more serious going on, so get that checked. This guy waited too long. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. Thanks. So, as I mentioned earlier, the reflux uh, it doesn't have to even be a large amount of acid. It can be weakly acidic. It doesn't matter exactly how strong the acid is, so to speak. <clears throat> but it's more about the, the esophagus not clearing the acid, getting exposed to it and not clearing it, and that's where the damage occurs. So we're, we're treating <coughs> reflux disease, gastroesophageal reflux disease. We're trying to prevent that from happening. This uh, schematic here um, just kind of gives a little bit of basic anatomy. You can see the close relationship of the trachea, which is the ringed portion in the front there. It's right in front of the esophagus. You have your epiglottis, that flat valve in the back of your throat, that when you swallow, closes off the airway. But if things reflux back up, that's not necessarily closed and things can go down into the airways. You see uh, marked there, I'm a little bit small, I'm sorry, but uh, the lower esophageal sphincter, or LES as I'm going to call it from now on because that's going to save some time. Um, that is a barrier that is formed. It's not a, what we call a true sphincter. It's not a muscle that's, that's constantly constricted, but it's a muscle area that is larger than the area around it to provide a buffer from acid coming up. And the diaphragm, which we'll talk about a little bit later, also coincides with that, and by pinching that area off, it prevents things from going the wrong direction. Next slide, please. So it's normal for that lower esophageal sphincter to relax. After a meal, uh, pressures build up. Uh, it's, you have to vent, basically. It might not necessarily belch because it's happening. And I, it might be something you're not even aware of occurring, but that is a normal uh, process. Um, it, it sometimes this relaxation is occurring more frequently, allowing more acid to uh, come up into the esophagus. And we're not sure why that happens in certain individuals. And these are the people that get gastroesophageal reflux disease. And it shouldn't really occur during sleep. There's something called transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations. These occur all the time, but if they're more prolonged or if they're occurring in sleep when they're not supposed to, when your body's supposed to be keeping that area tight, then you can get acid damage. So many people have reflux disease. I gave you some statistics about uh, the, the millions of people that are affected by this. Most don't have to go to the doctor, um, but most should. Um, if you're having chronic or persistent symptoms, you're seeing your primary care doctor. Usually they're starting you on some anti-reflux regimens or medications. When you start to have more persistent symptoms, especially through medical therapy or some of the uh, risk factors I mentioned that are concerning, that's when you need to see me. Next, please. Um, so, Two very important reasons. Um, if anybody here has had gastroesophageal reflux disease or is experiencing it, um, very negative impact on the quality of life. It's, um, it's not something that's fun to have on a regular basis. 
Additionally, there are those complications I mentioned, not the least of which is a risk factor for what's called adenocarcinoma, a type of cancer that can occur in the esophagus. Next, please. Ways that we prevent acid from refluxing is, uh, or I should say, are through multiple mechanisms, and they work all together. A breakdown of any one of them can cause people to get abnormal amounts of acid into their esophagus, but usually there's more than one thing going on. When you swallow, saliva is generated and it goes down. It starts the digestive process with salivary enzymes. There's a lot of bicarbonate in your saliva. That's helping to prevent the esophagus from getting damaged by acid. Your esophagus has uh, mechanisms that help it to clear things. It's squeezing in a downward fashion, moving things out of the esophagus, and the cells of the esophagus are designed to be resistant to that small amount of acid that's normal to get. It's anything that breaks that down, for example, if you take what are called non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, aspirin, ibuprofen, Motrin, Advil, Leaf, or brand names, those things can uh, decrease the integrity of the cells of the esophagus. There's many reasons that people need to be on those medications. If you don't, you have to be aware that there are risks to those medications also. So that barrier can be broken. I talked about the lower esophageal sphincter and the diaphragm, that barrier that provide, prevents acid from refluxing. And additionally, your stomach needs to be emptying properly also. If we've experienced uh, heartburn uh, on an occasional basis, we notice it's after a very large meal or a lot of fatty foods. That's delaying the stomach from emptying because it has to process that large meal, and that can make us reflux more. Next slide, please. Many of you have heard of a hiatal hernia or hiatus hernia. Um, I'll explain what that actually means. Um, the diaphragm is a, that flat, large muscle that I've showed pictures of. It's uh, basically a bellows that pulls down and lets our lungs fill up with air. It's part of the breathing process. Next slide, please. This is an example of how it normally should be working, where the diaphragm is lined up with the lower portion of the esophagus. There's something called a hiatus. A hiatus is an opening in the diaphragm to allow the esophagus and other organs to come through. Here's it's where it's meeting the stomach. Notice the stomach is in the abdominal cavity. Above the diaphragm is the chest where the majority of the esophagus lies. Next slide, please. If there's a weakening in that hiatus, where it is basically becoming looser, then that can allow portion of the, a portion of the stomach to, to go up into the chest. The next slide will illustrate how that can occur. The most common type, I'm sorry, that will be afterwards, but the next uh, slide, please, will show a um, hiatal hernia occurring where this is the diaphragm here. The lower esophageal sphincter is not lined up with it anymore. And because of that weakening that's occurring, you have this reservoir of a stomach in the chest where look how much easier acid could go up into there now. So people often say, I think I have a hernia in my chest. It's not a typical hernia you think of, um, which Dr. McEnany would repair, like in your groin or somewhere else. This is internal, and the most common symptom of that is not like a bulge or something that you'd feel. It's the reflux of acid that you might get. Many people don't even know they have them, though. If you go back a slide, please. So the um, in incidence of hiatal hernias are more common as we get older, and we don't necessarily know why. There's nothing you can do to prevent yourself from getting a hiatal hernia. There are some conditions where people are born with conditions that uh, allow the esophagus, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the diaphragm to become weak. But most of the time, it's because uh, of the aging process. Obesity, uh, pregnancy, these are things that increase the size of the abdomen. They can also weaken the diaphragm and uh, create more pressures, and a hiatal hernia can occur. If we could go up two slides, please. Thanks. So we talked about some of the classic symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux disease. <clears throat> I'll also get into some more detail about the extraesophageal things that we have alluded to and atypical symptoms, and then what are some complications that can occur with reflux. So this is uh, Reflux Robert over here. Um, he doesn't look uh, too happy, but he's getting classic symptoms of heartburn, the burning. Um, it's usually after eating. It can happen more when he's laying down. Gravity lets things come back up more easily. Don't eat late and go to bed. You'll pay a price usually. He's a typical patient that, you know, he gets it once in a while, he'll take a, a Tums or a Rolaids or something similar and he'll feel better and he'll be able to go back to sleep. Next slide, please. Some of the extra esophageal manifestations of reflux, and the list is long, occurs uh, in the lungs, asthma, uh, pneumonias, bronchitis, scarring of the lungs. Uh, you might see an ear, nose, and throat doctor about some of the problems of reflux disease, like the hoarseness that can occur in the laryngitis, the coughing. Um, sometimes you can get uh, problems with chronic sinusitis. These uh, entities here like uh, narrowing of the uh, uh, upper airway or where the oropharynx is or of laryngeal cancer are a little bit more controversial, but you can imagine how if reflux is occurring to that level, going all the way up in the mechanisms that can occur that allow that to happen, that chronic irritation, that chronic exposure, damaging materials 
would be a risk factor for these kind of problems. Luckily, quite rare. Chest pain and uh, dental erosion, as we also talked about. I'll show you some more slides about that. This is uh, an example of some swelling of the vocal cords that you might see your ear, nose, and throat doctor about. And this could cause problems with uh, sensation of a lump in the throat or a chronic sense of hoarseness. And this is an example of some of the dental erosions that can occur. Um, and that can be just on the basis of acid alone. Next slide, please. Just a, a simple diagram showing that you know, reflux of acids going all the way up through the esophagus and back down. Remember that trachea I told you about and how they're very close in pro approximation? It can start to go into the lungs. There's pathways that can get stimulated that are uh, part of the innervation of what are called the bronchi, the uh, pipes that the lung uh, contains that can constrict and it'd be a result of acid reflux. There are many other causes of that, but acid can be one of those causes. Next, please. We talked about dysphagia, difficulty swallowing food, odynophagia, which is pain on swallowing food and bleeding. These are what we call red flags or alarm symptoms. This is when you need to get checked out very quickly. Do not ignore these kind of symptoms. As far as the typical diagnosis, I showed you that typical patient laying there uh, in discomfort. Let's say he's having that two, three times a week. He's not showing any signs of any complications. He's not complaining of uh, chest pain that might make us think about his heart. He's not having trouble swallowing or signs of bleeding. His primary care doctor has not uh, found him to be anemic or anything like that. So we might just say, hey, uh, Reflux Robert, let's try some uh, lifestyle changes here. Um, maybe you could try to lose a little weight, and I'll go through some other slides about some things we can do. But you don't need to have to do a lot of tests for that. You can try to implement treatments and see if people get better. Next slide, please. When you need to do tests is when the diagnosis is unclear, there's not a response to treatment, or there's some of those serious complaints that uh, we need to start to do more of the tests I'll get into. Uh, next slide, please. So, if somebody comes in with chest pain, uh, they come into the emergency department or they go see their primary care doctor, the primary care doctor uh, or any physician will have a list of possible causes. And reflux disease will be on that list. Um, but your heart is the most important thing to work on first. That's where somebody has to say, okay, I think that we need to do an EKG, get a stress test, and then say from there, I don't think it's your heart time to go see the gastroenterologist about the possibility of reflux disease being a cause. And sometimes the only manifestation somebody can have of reflux is chest pain, but it's never the reason to go to a, I mean, to a gastroenterologist first. Thanks. One thing that's um, important to remember, though, is that the esophagus and the heart actually share the, the same innervation. And that's where the confusion can come in, where they can, uh, a, a heart problem or a reflux problem, they can mimic each other. So as far as um, tests that can be performed for reflux disease, I put barium swallow on there, and it's not a test for reflux disease, but I put it on there because it can be used for other reasons. The tests that are usually used for reflux are upper endoscopy, and I'll get into that, uh, what's called ambulatory pH monitoring. If you remember uh, your, your chemistry, that's a way to measure acidity or the basic components of reflux. And esophageal manometry, is, which is a way to measure how the esophagus is squeezing, its muscle contractions. A barium swallow can be of use if someone is having trouble with the uh, swallowing mechanism and you're trying to get more of a, a road map. What, what's going on with the anatomy? Is there a stricture or a mass? Uh, a bird's beak happens with something called achalasia or pseudoachalasia. This is a motor disorder of the esophagus where it's not functioning properly in terms of how it squeezes or how it relaxes. Pseudoachalasia is where that motor problem is actually being caused by a malignancy, a cancer. It's mimicking the achalasia, this motor disorder. Sometimes it gives us more information about a hiatal hernia. Dr. McEnany would like to know a lot about that. If he's going to take you to surgery, he wants to know what's going on in the inside and the scope and a barren swallow can help. It's limited though. It can't get very detailed looks. You can't take biopsies. You can't do therapeutics. It's a picture, but it does help sometimes. Endoscopy, I don't know if, uh, well, I see some of you actually that have had that test, <laughs> but uh, if you haven't, it's a um, flexible lighted tube that's able to be passed down through the mouth into the esophagus in the first part of the small intestine. And it's um, very flexible, very thin. It uses a great big light source to give us a lot of uh, uh, light energy in there to see what's going on. And it has a video chip and fiber optics so we can look on a nice television monitor as to what's going on inside. And it's, it's a very useful test. And also it has the benefit of being able to do other things like take biopsies, samples, so that we can have that analyzed by a pathologist to see if there's different things going on. Here's a picture of 
a lot of erosions in the bottom of the esophagus and starting to narrow down. This is, might be developing into a stricture or a narrowing. Right now it could just be from swelling and there's treatments that we could provide if we saw this that may not need anything but medication. Um, but when we do endoscopies or when there's alarm symptoms, um, people are you know, classically showing reflux complaints, but they're not responding to therapy. We're trying to get more information. Um, they're about to see Dr. McEnany about a surgery, and he needs more detail of the anatomy. And we'll talk about something called Barrett's esophagus, which is a change in the esophageal lining that is only able to be detected by endoscopy, and it can be a risk factor for cancer. <coughs> a pH probe, a 24-hour esophageal pH study, is a catheter that is placed down and through uh, the nose, and it's a way to try to measure how much acidic contents is actually coming up into the esophagus. Now, I saw some of you look at me like, you can stick that in my nose. That sounds uh, <laughs> really unpleasant. Um, we usually use it if somebody's uh, diagnosis is unclear, they're not responding to treatment, or they're about to maybe go for surgery, and we're trying to really delineate that this is acid reflux, so they might have the best benefit from surgery. Um, next slide, please. So, th this just re reiterates what I kind of just said. Um, this is uh, a gentleman who is wearing an older version. We have actually decreased the size of those recorders now. <laughs> but the basic premise is still there where he has this catheter that was placed through his nose into his esophagus and is sitting at the bottom right where his stomach and esophagus meet. He's got this recording device on. It's very useful because it does give us a direct measurement of how much acid is going on and you can correlate it with symptoms and have a scoring system so that you can try to provide a lot of information. It's not a, by any means a gold standard. Um, it does not necessarily rule um, uh, gastrointestinal reflux disease in or out, but if somebody's um, really trying to get more information about whether they might benefit from, for example, surgery, it's a very important test to have. Now, one thing that we're really uh, grateful about, this is just an example of um, normal acid exposure, this line being uh, an abnormal amount of acid in the esophagus. You can see how this reflux patient has a lot of spikes down in the acid portion over the course of a day. Next slide, please. What we're happy about now is we have something that's better than a catheter in the nose called a Bravo capsule. And it is a pH probe analyzer that we can place with a scope and actually clip it to the esophagus so there's nothing extraneous other than a radio frequency recorder that you wear that can get this data transmitted to it. And so that sounds a lot more physiologic. Some of its uh, downfalls are that you have to usually do a scope to place that probe. Um, how can I say this? The insurance companies aren't very happy about that because it does add to the expense of the study. Patients are very happy about that because they don't have to walk around with something <laughs> in their nose all the time. Next slide, please. So uh, before it actually said that you don't have to worry about it getting removed either. It'll slough off on its own and it will go um, out with the regular waste that you pass and you won't even know. That's the size of it. Um, there's an example of it being placed down into the bottom of the esophagus and sitting there and transmitting the data right to that recorder that you just wear like a beeper. Um, it's obviously much more accepted. Um, people can feel better about having a normal day. When we do the uh, pH probes, and again, a lot of insurance companies will mandate that we do the 24-hour pH probe and will not allow us or will not pay for us to do these capsules. We still tell the patient then, okay, now, I want you to do the, the thing you normally do, like have a normal day, go out and eat and you know, do your regular activities, and they're like, I have a, a thing sticking out of my nose. How am I going to do this? But uh, that's sometimes what has to happen. You get a longer um, data recording period of 48 <coughs> hours. So the longer you can have an analysis, then obviously the more data you can acquire and the better information you can get. Um, and one thing about having a catheter through the nose is it is a, it's floating there. So it, it might move. The capsule is more likely to stay in place. Uh, that's SCJ, it means squamal columnar junction, just above where the esophagus and stomach meet. So that's another um, portion of accuracy. Um, the problem with the capsule can also be, though, that not only does it have to, you know, be placed with a scope, some institutions will try to place without a scope, but that's not very typical. Um, you do have to get that procedure done. There is some sedative involved, and then there's the risks of placing a capsule. There can be uh, complications of discomfort as it gets clipped there, um, uh, perforations or rare tears and things like that that can occur. So, you know, we, we don't tread lightly. I, I do pass uh, some um, humor about the, the insurance companies, but there are specific reasons why these tests need to be done, and that's why you go to your specialist and we talk about the pros and cons of different approaches. Esophageal manometry is measuring the muscle contractions of the esophagus, and it's another catheter that's placed through the nose. There's no other way to do that, but you don't have to walk around all day with it. It's a test that it, you, the catheter is passed, muscle contractions are measured, and then the catheter is removed. You can't do it with sedation, otherwise you won't get accurate uh, measurements of what the muscle contractions are doing. 
Um, but it is very useful, especially if somebody is going to go to surgery to make sure that their esophagus is squeezing properly, that the, uh, the ability of the esophagus to um, work properly after a surgery that Dr. McEnany will talk to you about. Um, it, it, uh, it doesn't provide contraindications to doing that surgery. Additionally, we use it for people who are having swallowing problems. We don't know why. We're trying to figure out if there's a motor mechanism difficulty. We've done all the other tests. Um, next slide, please. There's an example of the manometry. There is something that I haven't put a slide about that is um, emerging, especially in tertiary centers, and we're actually going to be getting the equipment here. It's called impedance testing. And it uh, stands for multi uh, multi-channel intraluminal uh, impedance testing, which is a way to actually measure non-acid reflux also. We try to combine it often with manometry and the pH probe. And this device will have um, several recorders that measure resistance. If you remember uh, electrical uh, conduction, ohms. Ohms is a way to measure resistance. And so it can actually give us information that we never were able to get before about how gas might be refluxing, non-acid reflux might be occurring how things are moving through the esophagus when you eat what's called a bolus and how is it going through and it gives us more information that's more physiologic not just you know come on in we're going to do this test and um, we're going to hope that it actually correlates with what you do on a normal day. So what are our goals to treat reflux disease? Obviously we want to eliminate symptoms. If you've gotten to the point where you've had to have a scope and inflammation has been found we want to heal that inflammation otherwise known as esophagitis. We want to try to prevent complications, or if they're occurring, we want to heal them up, and we want to maintain that. So the cornerstone of treatment, and many of you are familiar with a lot of these different things, um, are to uh, elevate the head of the bed and uh, avoid eating too late, as I mentioned before. If you do have uh, experience with overweight uh, problems, then lose weight, stop smoking. Uh, watch how, what you eat. Avoid fatty foods, fried foods, typical uh, acidic components like carbonated beverages. Um, a lot of sodas are very acidic and they're carbonated. You know, it's interesting, many people um, say that uh, they feel better if they drink something fizzy. But in truth, you're actually causing more reflux. Something that's carbonated is going to effervesce, and it's going to make things go up into the esophagus. So that's something to avoid. Um, and you should eat smaller, more frequent meals, and sometimes you need to use medications. These are some of the uh, medical theories that are available, and some are actually not listed. But many of you are familiar with what are called H2 receptor antagonists and also proton pump inhibitors. Uh, this is basically less potent than this. Resistance or tolerance can develop to these medications, so they're much more effective on a as-needed or episodic basis, where these are much more effective as chronic therapies. As far as the effectiveness, so those lifestyle modifications, 20% efficacy, one in five people will get better, then the rest aren't. So usually you have to step up the ladder of treatment. About half of people will get better with H2 receptor antagonists. People taking a proton pump inhibitor once a day the most potent uh, suppressor of acid, it's actually, there's these cells called parietal cells, they secrete a hydrogen ion, acid. They block that pump from working. So they really work very well in up to 80% of people. And if you go up to a twice a day dose, up to 100% of people will have treatment uh, effectiveness for reflux. If there are persistent symptoms, uh, then we wonder if people are taking their medications or not. And we all know that sometimes we don't take the medicines that we've been told to do. Um, one thing that you can take away from this, if you are taking acid blockers like uh, Prilosec, for example, is, uh, or any of the others, is to take them about 30 minutes before meals. The most effective meal is breakfast. If you take it before breakfast, 30 minutes, that's going to maximize the amount of pumps you block. The medicine itself is out of your system in several hours. The pumps usually start to turn on while we're waking up from sleep. Even if we don't eat breakfast, we're supposed to. Our liver has used all its energy stores overnight and it wants us to eat to replenish what we have uh, lost. And so pumps are turning on anticipating that you're going to eat something. If you actually do eat, more pumps will turn on. By taking that medication a half hour beforehand, it'll get through the bloodstream to the receptors. The more receptors that are on, the more receptors that it'll block, the more effective the medication will be. So remember that, please. If people aren't responding, then we consider switching to a different medication, although in practice, they're all about the same. Certain people do do better with others. That's trial and error. Next, please. The one thing also to remember, or another thing I should say, is that uh, reflux disease is a chronic relapsing condition, especially if somebody has esophagitis. If they've been found to have inflammation in their esophagus, within two months, more than half are going to have symptoms again if they come off medicine. In six months, more than 80% are going to have uh, recurrent symptoms. So usually maintenance therapy is required. So as far as complications, most people do not get complications. 
out of the millions and millions of people that are experiencing reflux disease, uh, I don't want you to worry too much, but you have to watch out for serious complications, and that's why we're talking about this. We mentioned some of the erosion ulcers that can occur. Okay, a, little, a little feedback. Um, there can be uh, what's called a peptic stricture. We'll get in a little bit more about uh, Barrett's esophagus and adenocarcinoma. The erosions, um, people are very familiar with stomach ulcers, uh, but there can actually be uh, ulcerations or a breakdown in the lining of the esophagus too that can occur with acid reflux. Sometimes you might not even know that you're having these erosion or ulcerations occurring. And the only thing that might be uh, noted is anemia or that your doctor might detect blood in your stool that you're not even seeing. And again, that slide is showing the erosive esophagitis, and you can see how angry and uh, narrow that esophagus is getting stricture can develop when, as you imagine any other place that's getting chronically irritated or scarring, it's going to continue to scar down and it can become narrower and narrower. Next slide, please. So this is, oh, we went there too, that's okay. Um, this is a bearing swallow showing the esophagus at its normal caliber and then coming down to a taper, obviously a narrowing there, and then the scope showing look, uh, how tight the, uh, the bottom of the esophagus is that's from chronic acid exposure. These are uh, different methods we can use, different types of dilators we can use to open that area up. And here's an example of a narrowing with a balloon placed that's inflated, and you can see the before and after. It doesn't look like much, but all you need is about 12 millimeters uh, to actually pass food or pills through. So uh, often this will have to go uh, through a serial set of dilations, meaning we do it over a series of, of uh, procedures to gradually open it up because you don't want to open it up too quickly and rupture it. We talked a little bit about the lung and throat problems that can occur and, and it's something to also keep in mind. Um, reflux can cause chronic cough, can be an inducer of asthma. The three most common causes of uh, chronic cough are reflux disease, undetected asthma, and postnasal drip. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, Barrett's esophagus is something I talked to you about uh, a couple of slides, is when there's changes in the lining of the esophagus, and the most common reason we know about is chronic acid exposure. Your esophageal cells are of a certain nature called squamous cells, and they're <coughs> not used to being bathed in acid all the time. So, uh, and maybe a little bit of an oversimplification, but those esophageal cells are like, maybe I'm a stomach cell, I'm, I need to change. And when cells change, that means they're mutating. When cells mutate into intestinal cells, then those mutations can lead to further mutations and can be a risk factor for cancer. Next slide, please. This is an example of Barrett's esophagus, as we can see. The other slides, maybe you might have seen that that ring, which is called squamous columnar junction, is usually right about here, and you can see it's migrating. Those are cells that are changing, and why only a scope can see it. It's not a diagnosis you make just by visualizing it, though. You have to actually confirm it with biopsies. These biopsies are not something that you would feel. You don't have pain receptors in your esophagus, but that's the way you make the diagnosis. This is an example of a cancer that developed in an esophagus and actually had to have, the person had to have their esophagus removed. So these cells, these Barrett's cells, as they're called, but uh, named after the gentleman that discovered them, they can transform into cancer, but the risk is still very low. Um, there's not a guarantee that if somebody has Barrett's esophagus that they're going to get esophageal cancer. The cancer risk is actually about... Uh, 0.5% per year, about a 1 in 200 chance. But people who do have Barrett's esophagus, we will keep an eye on them. There are protocols we follow uh, that are surveillance methods where we will peer up, periodically scope and biopsy. Those are evolving. It's a far from perfect uh, way to screen and survey people, but it is something that we uh, do do on a regular basis. And uh, as the years go on, we'll probably have newer and newer guidelines that will emerge. There's two main types of esophageal cancer. There's squamous cell cancer and adenocarcinoma. Barrett's esophagus is a risk factor for adenocarcinoma. Squamous cell cancer, next slide please, is um, not actually a, uh, a, a cancer that's caused by reflux disease. It's more uh, alcohol and tobacco. There is a rise in adenocarcinoma, especially in white males over 50. Uh, it's still a very rare cancer, but its increase is, is quite dramatic right now. Um, as an example, though, colon cancer is far more common and uh, requires far more screening, but it's something to keep in mind. <coughs> Next slide, please. And this is an endoscopic and uh, barium view of an esophageal cancer. Um, you can see that caliber of scope getting very, uh, sorry, the esophagus getting very irregular 
and leading to a scope that is showing um, this narrowing. Next slide, please. So we talked about some of the therapies that are available, like lifestyle modifications and uh, the medications that might be out there. There are some, what I would consider more experimental treatments right now. Um, there's something called Strata Procedure, uh, which is a radiofrequency uh, method that energy is delivered to the body of the esophagus. It changes the tissue so that it actually becomes less sensitive to acid. Um, it's really reserved for very strict situations right now, um, as are these other uh, methods, uh, endoscopic plication, where you can actually, through a scope without actually having an operation, suture the bottom of the esophagus or put plicators, which are ways to bolster the bottom of the esophagus so that acid can't come up as easily. There was a product uh, called Enterix, an uh, inert biopolymer that was injectable into the bottom of the esophagus and would bolster the bottom. They're trying to reintroduce these biopolymers. That product actually got taken off the market in 2005 because of complications that arose. But these are all evolving therapies and more studies are there, are uh, emerging, I should say. If you talk to your doctor about different ways of treating reflux, and it comes to talking about these endoscopic methods, you're usually going to end up going to uh, one of the universities to maybe get into a trial if that's what you're, what you're interested in. They're not available widely in the community yet. Dr. McEnany is going to talk to you about uh, anti-reflux surgery. One thing I just want to make sure you know, it's not for Barrett's esophagus alone. Next slide, please. And he'll go through all the details of the, uh, the surgical techniques he uses. Next, please. So in conclusion, um, you know you're getting older when the fire in your belly is actually acid reflux. Thank you very much. I'll let Dr. McNeese talk and we'll take questions after. Sure.